E.M. Hotep. E.M. Hotep family. You're tuning into the Pro Black Perspective on KWAZ Radio. Uh, what we're going to do right now is we're going to discuss um, episode... Wait, did I, did I update the... Hold on a second. I guess SA-22. I'm, uh, I'm not sure if I updated it or not. But it's either episode 22 or episode 23. And um, this is Chin Weizu's Socialism or Communalism. Uh, he says the race will be exterminated if it does not build a black superpower in Africa by the end of this century. That's it. Like, if you want to know the skinny, we will be exterminated if we do not build a black superpower in Africa by the end of this century. Time is running out. Time is running out. Uh, Socialism or Communalism by Chin Weizu. So several African leaders of the independence generation advocated or implemented what they called socialism. Professor Pra reports that... Uh, actually, give me two seconds. Professor Pra reports that... There you go. Damn, I just accidentally slammed down my control. Uh, Professor Pra reports that by the end, by the mid-1960s, practically all African heads of state, with the exception of Haile Selassie of Ethiopia, Leon Ba of Ghana, of Gabon, and V.S. Tubman of Liberia, had at one time or the other espoused African socialism. Consistently, such ide- ideologues have put a distance between what they variously defined as African socialism and 20th century Marxism socialist formulae with the emphasis on class struggle. Tom Mboya anchored his definition of African socialism on the pre-industrial communitarian ethos of Africa and Tanzania. Under Julius Nyerere, populist socialism was described as Ujamaa socialism. So this is in the book, um, African Nation, uh, pages 80 to 81. And that, that's really important that most every uh, leader in Africa was, uh, you know, like a, a, a so like advocated for socialism or, or something. Um, he says several leaders of the, he said practically all of the heads of state in Africa advocated for socialism by the mid 1960s. Uh, Trigger Happy is here. He says definitely ready for this. Uh, learning curve says greetings uh, family get the like up please um, he basically answers every question and all my thoughts I have had on the topic so Trigger Happy likes to spoil I'm surprised that Trigger Happy just decided to read this right before I read it just so he could spoil it so that's that's, that's cool uh, but uh, what was I going to say by the way fam make sure y'all join the discord just in case I just got a, a strike against this um, this uh, this channel uh, in regards to a, a different, you know, in regards to my regular programming, uh, they said I was like displaying violence or something. I don't know, but w- the appeal process was very rapid. Like, 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 I appealed the decision, they responded back in five minutes. Like, fuck you. You know what I mean? So uh, basically, you never know. But you know, the, the the watch hours are getting up, and I'm guessing that they're like, oh no, he's getting close to monetization. So let's just, you know, we don't want this motherfucker. You know what I mean? Uh, Tikam Ja uh, says, uh, Nijwa says, um, peace family. Uh, Trigger Happy says, don't worry, I won't spoil it. Although he just did, but you know, we get it. Also, yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> so the African socialism of many of these leaders was a prestigious missed no more. by the way how long is this one um if you don't mind you can spoil that <laughs> the african socialism of many of these leaders was a prestigious misnomer for african communalism here in tom and boya's exposition of it his is quite representative of expositions by niere kwanda segor mamadou dia etc by the way for, for those who don't know who tom and boya was uh he was a kenyan um freedom fighter i guess the you know in like he was of, of the Luo descent, whereas um, uh, Kenyatta was, I'm guessing, of the Kikuyu descent. And then Tom Boya is killed. Like he was like they were both front runners for the leadership of Kenya after independence. And Tom and Boya is mysteriously killed. Uh, some people believe Kenyatta had his hands in it, but you know, 
that's what some people believe. All right, in Africa, the belief that we are all sons and daughters of the soil has always exercised tremendous influence on our social, economic, and political relationships. From this belief springs the logic and the practice of equality and the acceptance of communal ownership of the vital means of life, the land. The whole is to us the symbol of work. The, the, the whole family. <laughs> Every able-bodied man and woman... Actually, let me reread this because I, I think I lost a little bit of attention. In Africa, the belief that we are all sons and daughters of the soil has always exercised tremendous influence on our social, economic, and political relationships. From this belief springs the logic and the practice of equality and the acceptance of communal ownership of the vital means of life, the land. The hoe is to us the symbol of work. Every able-bodied man and woman, girl and boy, has always worked. Laziness has not been tolerated and appropriate social sanctions have developed against it. There has been equality of opportunity for everyone had land, or rather the use of land, and a hoe at the start of life. The acquisitive instinct, which is largely responsible for the vicious excesses and exploitation, acquisitive so acquisitive so like trying to acquire things instinct which is largely responsible for the vicious excesses and exploitation under the capitalist system was tempered by a sense of togetherness and a rejection of graft and meanness there was loyalty to the society and the society gave its members much in return a sense of security and universal hospitality these are the values for which in my view african socialism stands the ideas and attitudes which nourish it are indigenous and are easily learned, for they have been expressed for generations in the language of the soil, which our people understand, and not in foreign slogans. All African leaders who have written on this subject are agreed on these points. President Nyerere has said, My fellow countrymen can understand socialism only as cooperation. And President Senghor of Senegal, speaking at the Dakar conference in December 1962 on the African roads to socialism, said socialism is the merciless fight against social dishonesties and injustices, fraudulent conversions of public funds, rackets, and bribes. I have, I hope, given some idea already of the reason why Africans call these attitudes African socialism and not just socialism. There is a positive desire rising out of what may start as a negative reaction that whatever is of value in Africa's own culture and our own social institutions should be brought out to contribute to the creation of the new African nation. I wrote earlier about the task of reconstructing the economy in the days after independence. In the effort to do this, new values have to be established in place of colonial values, and we have to decide what part the traditional African social and cultural structure can play in the country's economic development. Its main difference from the European structure, which was of course the one officially favored during the colonial era, is that is by is that is that it is communal by nature. Most African tribes have a communal approach to life. A person is an individual only to the extent that he is a member of a clan, a community, or a family. Land was never owned by an individual, but by the people, and could not be disposed of by anybody. <laughs> Where there were traditional heads, they held land and trust for the community generally. Food grown on the land was regarded as food to feed the hungry among the tribe. Although each family might have its own piece of land on which to cultivate, when there was famine or when someone simply wanted to eat, he merely looked for food and ate it. When money was introduced, the African came to work for wages, but he still maintained contact with his native land as the only source of security to which he could look in old age or in sickness. He was secure in his mind that he could go back to his home and be taken care of by his people. It was a social security scheme, with no written rules, but with a strict pattern to which everyone adhered. If someone did not adhere to the pattern and did not take on the obligations inherited in the system, he found that when he next got into trouble, he received little or no attention. He was expected to live harmoniously with others in his community and to make his contribution to work done in the village. The practice of African socialism involves trying to use what is relevant and good in these African customs to create new values in the changing world of the money economy, to build an economy which reflects the thinking of the great majority of the people. The challenge of African socialism is to use these traditions to find a way to build a society in which there is a place for everybody, where everybody shares both in poverty and in prosperity, and where emphasis is placed upon production by everyone, with security for all. In his booklet, Ujama, The Basis of African Socialism, 
Julius Nyerere brings out clearly the essential difference of African from European socialism. He writes, The foundation and the objective of African socialism is the extended family. The true African socialism does not look on one class of men as his brethren and another as his natural enemies. He does not form an alliance with the brethren for the extermination of the non-brethren. He rather regards all men as his brethren, as members of his ever-extending family. Ujama, then, or familyhood, describes our socialism. It is opposed to capitalism, which seeks to build a happy society on the basis of the exploitation of man by man and is equally opposed to doctrinaire socialism, which seeks to build its happy society on the philosophy of an inevitable, inevitable conflict between man and man. That's Tom and Boya, African Socialism. I tried to just read it straight through. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm thinking that my next book, um, so Trigger Happy says 10 pages, Reciprocity. Yeah, I said before, in a con psychology principle, someone isn't a person if they are not contributing to the community. Yeah. Um, I want to say that, you know, while I was reading that, you know, so I'll, what I want to do next, I'm thinking is that I'm going to do like a daily, if I can, a daily reading of Niere. Um, uh, I actually did not agree with Niere just there. I think Tom Boyle was saying it better. Uh, but another thing I would want to add just to, you know, just for us as an African people is that uh, you want to when you're talking about economics, you want to highlight what you're doing with outside nations too, how you're engaging outside nations. The the issue here is that this all feels good, it all sounds good, um, but it doesn't really address you know how the underlying economy is going to work. You know, everybody eating and like like the village life that he's describing doesn't necessarily address the town life that you would want um, these economic principles to go under. You know, essentially capitalism and socialism are kind of town philosophies that are different from the countryside philosophies. And so the countryside philosophies, even in Europe, were kind of a little bit more, you know, neighborly in a sense. Um, Trigger Happy says, I think that's where Garveyism comes in. No. Uh, yeah, well, the, again, what, what 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 that was about was really addressing what um, Tom and Boya was saying and what Nyerere is saying. But I'm I'm guessing, I'm guessing that Trigger Happy is trying to hint at something that uh, <laughs> you're Trigger Happy. Why didn't you just wait? You knew I was reading it. You could have just waited. His brother was like, Nah, you know, I'm gonna read it the day before just so I could be fresh and and, and tell this dude, Yo, he's going he's going just the garbage. All right, uh, so we don't even know now. We don't even know. So we're just going to see. Um, he's like, I'm not going to spoil it. <laughs> I'm joking. All right, so Nkrumah differed from all the others. Nkrumah is self-declared Marxist, espoused Marxism, which is also known as scientific socialism. He declared Pan-Africanism and socialism as organically complementary. One cannot be achieved without the other. Is that claim true? And Krumah merely asserted, but did not bother to demonstrate this dogma of his. Although I, I could say this, he did read, um, I mean, I don't agree with it either, but he did read, he did write Conscientiousism, which was um, him trying to combine uh, Pan-Africanism with Socialism, you know? So so I wouldn't really cite Revolutionary Path, um, although I didn't read Revolutionary Path, I wouldn't cite that as much as I would cite Conscientiousism. Which, again, I, I family, I did read that one and, and, you know, critique it and all that kind of stuff. Is that claim true? And Krumah merely asserted, but did not bother to demonstrate this dogma of his. Unfortunately, is false. As false as his most fallacious claims about what only a continental union government could achieve for Africans. It is like his opportunistic and Canute-like nonsense that if in the past the Sahara divided us, now it unites us. Marxism... Scientific socialism has as much organic or historical or cultural value connection with Africa as Hinduism, Taoism, or Shinto. Marxism in Africa, just like Christianity, is an alien imperialist import. For either of them to be organically connected to Pan-Africanism, European cultural imperialism would have to be organically connected to Africa, which is not the case. As Prab pointedly asked, what is the relevance of scientific socialism to the notion of African unity? So, you guys, make sure we should probably look into this pra. Um, book, uh, page 63. It has no relevance to the objectives of Pan-Africanism or to African history and culture. How can it be correctly said to be organically complementary to African Pan-Africanism? 
that Nkrumah was both a pan-Africanist and a Marxist is only a fortuitous coincidence in his intellectual life. It does not make pan-Africanism and Marxism organically related in any way. Furthermore, Ayi Kwe Arma, and that's that's a good brother too. Make sure you guys check out Arma. No, uh, Trigger Happy, can you tell me what page this thing ends on? Because I don't want to like rush through looking for the response, the answers, and then it turns out I'm just like near the end. Uh, Tikam says the country life and the town life often intersect. Yeah, they're supposed to trade and engage each other, but as far as like the economic structure or the cultural structure, the culture of the c town is very different from the culture of the um, of the of the of the country in the sense that you know when you say everybody has land like sure everybody has access to land in the country or everybody has access to the food in the country and the and the country kind of sends its surplus to the town but the town doesn't have like town people don't have land you know what i mean so like i may have a residence to live in but i don't have like a farm like you know what i mean like i don't have cattle i don't have crops um and that's like the big difference you know uh, like, like I don't have acres to my name. Uh, I have like a box, you know, I have like a shoe box to live in. Uh, Trigger Happy says what he is describing is what I think socialists do all the time, which is the incubator fallacy. They will say socialism is African because Marx took ideas from African society, but Marxism did it. Um, yeah, Marx, 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 see, that's the thing the, 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 the timeline for communists and by the way, if you what were the questions that you wanted to that, that you that you had before you read this? The the timeline for communism uh, is that it starts off with primitive communism, and then it goes to I think feudalism. No, I think it goes to slavery. Then it goes to feudalism, and then it goes to um, capitalism, and then from capitalism it goes to socialism, and then from socialism it goes to communism. So they will say that primitive communism is the um, is what is what it is what it is what we're what we're discussing but um and they'll say oh that's africa or whatever but like realistically it's a totally different system the socialism communism this idea is is realistically an outgrowth of capitalism you know uh and it's basically this idea that eventually um the proletariat from being exploited by the bourgeoisie will overtake the bourgeoisie and their industries and from take overtaking their industries be able to um, by overtaking the industries, they'll be able to, um, how do you say this? Oh yeah. So then after taking the, overtaking the industry, they will then use those industries that the capitalists have in order to give to the community. The thing is this though, that Africa does not have these industries. So Africa is not even at the stage of capitalism to which socialism could happen. And so what the description of people saying is, oh, this village life where everybody has land and so on and so forth. That's not socialism. That's not the scientific socialism that we're discussing. And not just that, you know, it has nothing to do with um, Marxian uh, view. Marx was of the belief that socialism could happen in England because England was like one of the most industrialized states at the time. You know, England, Germany, maybe America, but not even, he, he, he was not even a friend of uh, inhabiting in, in uh, Russia or in China. But what happened was that Russia and China rapidly industrialized and, and you know, you know, under the direction of the uh, state, and that was the the difference. But that's not necessarily the same as uh as the as the capitalism in, the, in, in question. Uh, so it basically is, it's it's just a so Marxism is kind of just sci-fi, science fiction. I look at it. I look at the science fiction. Um, a lot of it was under the belief that as society automates, you know, the bourgeoisie will become irrelevant. And you know, basically AI technology type stuff, um, and and so it's just kind of like a science fiction novel, uh, uh, reasonably argued, but you know, not really. But like, it's like it's like if you look at old videos of of people in the past in history, they would always say something like, um, "Oh, I think I think we're gonna have flying cars and robots doing everything for us." You know. Like, that's what Marx was basically on. He was like, oh, when the robots are doing everything for us, you know, when the proletariat is replaced and they're no longer necessary, then uh, essentially, you know, they're either going to starve or they're going to revolt. And if they revolt, this is the kind of direction that they should take, um, that kind of thing. And like you could and like even there's like this uh, somebody told me there's, there's this Israeli scholar today who who kind of says the same thing. But I was like, yeah, like Marx said it already. You know what I mean? But it's like it's like a typical common thing. In fact, an African-American uh, 
uh, historical lore, there's this guy named John Henry who talks about the same. Th- like, like the the whole story of John Henry is, oh, the machines are replacing us. You know, like it's just this philosophy of the machines are replacing us, um, which is like a recurring theme in a in a in industrial communities. Um, Dr. King also even mentions this. He's like, oh, black black Americans need to learn skills. Otherwise, we're going to be replaced. Um, like we're going to be become useless labor, basically. Um, and that's um, and that's like that's basically the that's basically the premise of Marxism. But it's missed when you apply it to Africa, where you're not really that industrialized, you know. Uh, anyway, so furthermore, I Kwai Arma has argued correctly in my view that Marxism. And he, he put quotation marks here. Marxism and its approach to non-Western societies and values is decidedly colonialist, Western, Eurocentric, and hegemonist. Uh, Marxism and its approach to non-Western majority of the world's people is demonstrably racist. I don't use the word racist anymore. Racist in a prejudiced, determined, dishonest, and intelligent fashion. Western racists hold that Western art is art, but African art is primitive art. What makes Western art civilized and modern is that it originates in the West. What makes African art primitive is that it originates in Africa. Racism is luxuriously illogical. That is partly why, for Marx and Engels, communism is modern, civilized, and serious when it appears in Europe, even if it has only a spectral form. The same communist phenomenon, when it manifests itself in non-Western world, is dismissed as primitive communism, even though it appears there not as a fuzzy liberal specter, but in human form. Vigorous pushing towards birth in societies familiar for ages with communism as a lost tradition and a real hope, often aborted sometimes fleetingly realized yeah so again so like i said they start off with primitive communism uh which again you know what what they're really talking about what these white boys are talking about when they say communism is basically mechanized communism basically when you look at a sci-fi show and you're like oh the artificial intelligence are doing all the work you know like um that's what they're talking about i can't remember the israeli guy he wrote this story because i remember the, the sister was telling me that you know he's a he's a scholar she liked he, he wrote this book called like homo sapiens or something like that but if you listen to his like i listen to his ted talk or whatever and you just realize that it parallels what marx was saying but in essence he's his argument is we have to we have to do something about what's going to happen when machines replace humans you know because if if humans can't find work anymore what are we going to do with them and so a lot of people have different philosophies on that and essentially marx's idea was that when the bourgeoisie no longer need human capital they will just let human capital starve you know other people are not of the opinion that human capital will will you know they'll just let the humans starve uh you know or they'll let the population dwindle down uh but it's a possibility either way it really only applies to industrial societies where human labor is replaced in africa that is not even a thing you know that's not a thing per se I mean, not to, I mean, like, 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 I mean, what, essentially Africa has so much land that technically you could just live off the land and just ignore the fact that the Western world is going that direction. Um, hopefully that's like helpful to people. So anyway, so since Pan-Africanism is anti-racist. Oh, yeah. So you said what page? Let me see. Let me just double check. So I'm on 421. He says it ends at 426. OK, so we have a few pages. All right. And by the way, if something comes up, just let us know. Um, then we could stop and whatever. Since Pan-Africanism is anti-racist, anti-colonialist and anti-Eurocentric, and Krumah cannot be correct in claiming that Pan-Africanism and a racist, colonialist, and Eurocentric Marxism, aka fantastic socialism, are organically complementary and that one cannot be achieved without the other. That is tantamount to claiming that anti-racism and racism, anti-colonialism and colonialism, anti-Eurocentrism and Eurocentrism must be achieved together in Africa. In contrast to Krumah's scientific socialism, the African socialism of the other leaders is derived from African communalism and therefore has a historic and organic link to African culture. As Nyerere explained, and see, that's what I like about this guy though you see how y'all look at my book my book um by the way check it out check out my book I'll, let me just show you guys what my book looks like while we're um while we're just discussing because you know I, I do i do want people to read my books as well so that's baba's that's that's my book i almost said baba uh <laughs> you know you're so used to talking to your son you're just gonna call yourself baba uh but yeah uh that's my book make sure you guys get some ratings up got uh a few stars you know I actually got like a negative, I got a couple of negative reviews actually, but one of them is from a white boy who was like, uh, uh, I don't agree. Anyway, but that's what I'm saying. You want your white boys to not agree. Um, What was I going to say? Yeah, so, you know, the thing about this book, you know, some brother was actually on my ass about that. He was like, why are you dissing, uh, why are you disrespecting Nkrumah? And then he's like, oh, I saw you with a picture in Nkrumah's grave 
and all that stuff. But you diss Nkrumah in your book, and it's like, yeah, we, you know, look at this. That's why I appreciate. I can appreciate about uh, this brother. He's not. He's not a fan Africanist. You know, he's not a fan Africanist. Yesterday, I was listening to this, uh, this lec, this YouTube discussion between James Small, Kaba, and this. Um, this boy named Chase or whatever, right? It's on the Happy YouTube channel, H A P I, right? Um, and it's just fan Africanism. It's just fan Africanism. Well, Dr. Clark said, and and what well, you know, uh, if you remember what Bamish Mission said, and and you know, just that, you know, just 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 appeals to authority. This guy is just like, let me take these people on their word. That's what I do too. I don't, I don't do that appeal. You know, if I, if I feel like Amos Wilson said something wrong, I tell you guys. I say, look, Amos Wilson said, like, I don't believe that shit. You know what I mean? That's the difference. There's the there's the authentic, hey, we got to get free. And then there's the fan Africans. Because these people collected, like, five, like, by the time I left, you know, I was there for, like, uh, maybe an hour or something. By the time I left, they collected, like, $500 off of that. You know what I mean? Which is, which is, which is not bad. Uh, all things considered, you know, I have my cash app, um, scrolling, you know, but if I were to type every time I got a cash app, I just wouldn't type, you know what I mean? Uh, Trigger Happy says, LOL, I didn't even bother to listen to it. Nah, it was some, it was some joke. These people, every five seconds, they were like, cash app, cash app love, you know, this person, $50. Cash app love, this person, $20. And it, and it wasn't capping, you know? We also saw the, the super chat going up, uh, Trigger Happy says, yeah, what's the point of studying history if we're not analytical and strategic about it? Yep, yeah, shit, boy. You already, you already know. By the way, that's just a term. I didn't mean to call you boy. It was just a term. That's just the slang that they use. I don't want you to be all like, yo, this motherfucker just called me boy? What the fuck? <laughs> anyway. uh, African socialism of the other leaders is derived from African communalism and therefore has a historic and organic link to African culture, as they had to explain. By the, by the use of the word ujama, therefore, we state that for us, socialism involves building on the foundation of our past and building also to our own design. We are not importing a foreign ideology into Tanzania and trying to smother our distinct social pattern with it. We have deliberately decided to grow as a society out of our own roots, but in a particular direction and towards a particular kind of objective. We are doing this by emphasizing certain characteristics of our traditional organization, extending them so that they can embrace the possibilities of modern technology and enable us to meet the challenge of life in the 20th century world. So, yeah, the possibility of modern technology, that's really, realistically, that's what it's all about. You know, those other economic models, they don't really uh, account for uh, modern technology. You know, that's why I, 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 I'm, it's a hard read. It's a long read. Well, the nations, but I do recommend it. I do think it's a, it's a good read because um, if nothing else, he's outlining uh, the, the, the economy of the town. You know what I mean? Um, which is something that you you kind of want to understand when you when you're dealing with the town versus the the, 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 the country because if you believe that you're just the countryside then you know like if you just do your economy based off the countryside it's it's not going to really develop the technology um, per se um anyway let's uh let's keep going so Nkrumah would have done well to follow Nyere and to heed as a Kiwi's wise uh, council on ideologies it is obligatory for us to adopt a tolerant skepticism in respect of alien ideologies and then examine par impartially our aboriginal lore of good living if we reacted otherwise wait, let me read this i'm sorry I, I, like my phone just like pinged it is obligatory for us to adopt a tolerant skepticism in respect of alien ideologies okay have a skepticism and then examine impartially our aboriginal lore of good living if we reacted otherwise, then we would be des desecrating the legacy which our forebears had bequeathed to us from past generations. So, as a Kiwi is, uh, by the way, he's in Nigeria. So, he's like, yeah, you know what I mean? We need to note that both capitalism and socialism are ideologies made in Europe to solve the peculiar problems of a modern European society in which two antagonistic classes confront each other, one having seized all the society's means of production, leaving the other with only its labor to sell to live. Unless and until that situation is replicated in Africa, and that would be a disaster, these rival ideologies will remain inappropriate for Africa. After all, theories about the camel's way of life should not be applied to the whales. That's it. It should be pointed out that the ancestral African political economy combined private ownership with communal ownership. As Kwanda described it, our ancestors worked collectively and cooperatively from start to finish. One might say this was a communist way of doing things, and yet these gardens remain strongly the property of individuals. One might say here that this was capitalism. 
Collectively and cooperatively, they harvested, but when it com comes to storing and selling their produce, they became strongly individualistic. They did not finish at that. When it came to sharing the fruits of their labors, like meals, for instance, they shared them communally. Indeed, one is compelled to say a strange mixture of 19th century capitalism and communism. Yet, as I said above, this was original and a pattern essentially African. So again, like this is not addressing the, 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 the means of production in terms of industry, you know? Like... The, the issue is with the communist and capitalist conversation is what do you do with industry? You know, if I open up a factory to make ice cream cones, right, is that factory going to belong to me or is it going to belong to the state or is it going to belong to the community? And and like and by belong, like where does the where do the profits go? Who decides the profit model? All that kind of stuff. Um, I'm selling ice cream cones, let's say, from from Zambia. Uh, into uh, like and, and that they're exported all the way down to to Ghana, right? Who owns that ice cream? The profits of that ice cream factory. Who owns the factory? You understand? Uh, this this right here is 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 still like it has nothing to do with the factory per se. This has more to do with um, like kind of maybe light industry, maybe. Um, maybe the agricultural, you know, oh, we're selling our goods. You know, we we all went together, collectively farmed the land. We have this many carrots, but then we're going to sell the carrots, you know, so on and so forth. But that's not industry, you know. What do you? What about if, you know, like for instance, Ghana just opened up recently uh, a mango canning factory, right? Where do the profits for the mango canning factory go? You know, is it to the factory owner? Is it to the state? Is it to the city state? Um, is it to the nation state? You know, uh, this is these are the like and, and under whose direction? Those are the question. Who invests in this kind of stuff? Uh, that's why it's a, it's not that um, like it's not that um, like it's not like this is a real address to the um, to the to the socialist to the socialist capitalism divide. It's kind of just saying, hey, you know, in our city, in our country life, you know, and it's like, yeah, that's the country life. But Wazungu, like, that's the thing I liked about when uh, Adam Smith's uh, Wealth of Nations is that he kind of shows you that Wazungu's country life was kind of basic, too. Well, not basic, but kind of like, oh, let's share, let's work together, let's, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, but that's that's not at all to do with the, the industry, you know, Um Trigger Happy says, now to be fair, when he said that until this situation, until it is situated in Africa, wouldn't some socialists argue that colonialism is simply imposing capitalism on us with a lack of strong industry of our own? Uh, so let's see. Now to be fair, when he said that you until it happens, wouldn't some socialists argue that colonialism is simply imposing capitalism? On us? Exactly. Well, that's the thing, though. It's like we don't actually have the capitalists in Africa. So the bourgeoisie are still foreigners. You know what I mean? Or the or for instance, what we're doing is we're exporting raw material into the factories of other nations. So like let's say if it's being created in China or if it's creating created in America or what have you, right? There are no bourgeoisie, there's no bourgeoisie class in Africa. So it's not that so what colonialism did was it kind of put us on the on the on the on the on the bottom as kind of like a global proletariat in a sense. But it did not really create local capitalists, local bourgeoisie in Africa. You know, so so colonialism did not impose capitalism on us per se, uh, or not in the same vein of oh, there's a class struggle between the proletariat and the capitalists. What it did was it made it so that the capitalists are safely, although the capitalists of other countries just kind of reduced us into the lower end of their economic model. Uh, but we, but like, again, like you're not going to be able to challenge, like like the, the average individual should just pull away from the European and the foreigner, not necessarily try to challenge his global stranglehold over his own people. You know, like, like not necessarily challenge his, like essentially you're not going to change this white boy's economy. You could just kick the white boy out. You know what I mean? Just take the white boy out and he could still... Like, he's still going to be a capitalist in his own country. You know what I mean? You, you, like, trying to change his his economy uh, 
is 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 just a little bit of a huge task that's not going to work at all because his people are all for it um like like in warfare you you want to focus on the morale of uh people so what is this did i read this one yeah um african socialism or african communalism so why did these African leaders choose to tag African socialism for what was actually African communalism? I suspect that in the global climate of the 1960s, which was dominated by the intra-European Cold War, they found the prestigious to attach a European label to their African-derived political ideology, hence the socialism. But they also needed to distinguish their ideology from European socialism, hence the African in the name. But I think the time has passed and we should seek to enhance the value of something African by making it seem a variant of something European. Our intellectual independence requires that we name things correctly and on our own terms. I will therefore use the term African communalism henceforth to describe what has been called African socialism towards an industrial communalism. Nyere, Senghor, Kwanda, Talamboya, Mamadou Dia, and the rest of them began the process of formulating the ideology for building a political economy that would put it in modern form, the pre-colonial African political economy of agrarian colonialism. So make sure you guys check out the word agrarian. So, and of course you see he's drawn to industrial, all right? So these, the project remains uncompleted and should be continued from where those pioneers left off. The challenge to work out an industrial upgrade of pre-colonial African communalism is before our intellectuals and should be taken up. As Nyerere put it, who is to keep us active in the struggle to convert nationalism to pan-Africanism if it is not the staffs and students of our universities? Who is it who will have the time and ability to think about the practical problems of achieving this goal of unification if it is not those who have an opportunity to think and learn without direct responsibility for day-to-day -day affairs? Basically, um, uh, young adults are so important. I liked when Nyerere... So one of the things that Nyerere... Um, so I put it in the Book of Power... Um, there's this quote from Nyerere that like really like almost brought me to tears, you know, um, and so it's like my like it's like like of all the like I have a quote I have a whole bunch of speeches in the Book of Power, but Nyerere is might have been like one of my favorites if not no no this is one of my favorites right because a lot of them are really good like Taharika oh gosh, <sighs> all right yeah Taharika like like that was like that was tops um, but anyway but uh. Nyere, um, he tells us that you have to focus on adult education. A lot of times we don't focus on adult education, and that's fine. You know, like we need people to focus on children's education. But he's like, adult education is important too. And so, you know, part of me, like if you guys are listening to me right now, you realize that a lot of what I do is adult education. You know, shout out to Learning Curve uh, Revolutionary Matron. She's all about children's education. And, you know, you can appreciate her for that, too. You know, you, you, you want to do both. You want to do both. But but a lot of times we do neglect adult education. And this, like, even this right here is, like, adult education. This is, like, my passion. And, like, when I go to Africa, like, this is kind of, like, what I would want to do, too. You know, um, in some capacity. Uh, but anyway, uh I mean, hopefully, eventually, you know, if you guys read Zubiri, you'll know that I, I, I really want to do physics, but um, but it is what it is. <laughs> um, uh, let's see something. Let's see. Trigger Happy. Trigger Happy says, look at, like, North Koreans, for example. They removed all naming of communism, Marxist-Leninism, and simply called it Juche and insisted that it was a distinct ideology for themselves. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sugar Happy says, I also think that it appealed to like many people at the time because it might have appealed to their communal sensibilities if it was the case that Marx took from African societies. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a Dr. Clark thing. That's what I was saying. Like, and that's the thing. A lot of black, a lot of Africans were educated in America. Some of them um, engaged with Dr. Clark, who was going on about you know Marx just took our idea, and it's like no, you know, like no, like. <sighs> Like I said, I, I, you know, and the thing is that, you know, Nkrumah studied with Dr. Clark. Like, I know a lot of us like Dr. Clark. Um, me personally, I don't like socialists, you know, um, if, if Nyerere wasn't a socialist, I'd like him a lot more, you know, um, but like, I just don't mess with socialists. And, you know, Garvey was talking against socialism himself, uh, but yeah, I just I just don't like socialists, and I just I just can't. But anyway, yeah. So, but that's the thing, like that whole oh well, you know, Trump Africans, like no, like no, you know, like like. Anyway, Trigger Happy says, but we aren't in the Cold War, so yeah. 
It also kind of like when people put black in front of feminism just sounds like another variant. Yeah, I mean, it's just black people just can't like these black people just love their white validation. It's almost ridiculous. It's like you have nothing independent of white people. Like, can you? Can you just be independent or can white people like why do you want to be so closely bonded in, in relation with these white folk? It's just ridiculous. It's like, oh, man, you know, this white man gave, you know, this white man got socialism from us. Like, like, calm down. Like, if you say he he got literature from you, sure. You know, if you say like, sure, like everybody got literature from you if you started it. But you're going to now say, oh, he got the socialism from us. Like, no, just no. Like, 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 shit, man. All right. Anyway, um, Trick Happy says, I'm saying might because I'm not even sure if Marx really took from Africans. I haven't seen the evidence of it. I do know anarchists did take from indigenous from when I studied. I mean, like, taking from people is like, like, it's just, like, people are going to, like, saying they took from somebody, it's like people are going to use solutions from other people sometimes from animals it's not it's not even complicated it's like uh like some people would say that the ancient egyptians did some like like learn how to like learn some building structure from like animals like dung beetles or like you know doing all that kind of stuff you know that's like like no, it's not even something to dis like if you're trying to find a solution for something and then you look out in nature and see a solution then that's it like, it's not even, it's not something to, like, you know, it's not, like, a bragging thing. It's, like, you know, like, it's just not even, it's not even a thing. It's, like, it's realistically not even a thing. Like, like, like yeah, you can observe nature. Like, like sometimes if you look at um, African, I call it Kupagane and Gumi, but you can say African martial arts or whatever, right? Um, a lot of those kicks that they did, they, like, based them off of what animals are doing. Like, how animals kick. Like, a lot of the Chinese martial artists were like, hey, how do animals do this? Like, like realistically speaking, you can observe other people. And it's not really like, oh, I'm taking from this. Like, it's not like you're taking. It's like, I mean, it's, it's just like what a normal person would do. If you're looking for a solution to your problem, if you have a problem in front of you, then you go about and try to do problem solving. And that problem solving might be in imitating and replicating other people, emulating other people. But, like, human beings are, like, um, are, like, pre-programmed to mimic other people, you know? Like, we have these these things in a kind of biological level. We have this thing called uh, mirror neurons. And these neurons fire on us so that if somebody's smiling at you, even somebody you don't like is smiling or laughing you're going to want to smile or laugh just off of that just off of your mirror neuron your the neurons in your body just triggering and firing off of this kind of stuff so it's just like we are like born mimics you know you know uh recording the the indigenous and saying you know what they had a solution on how to how to get maple from the top of a tree let's let's or maple out of a tree Let's, you know, if we do that, oh, we're copying them. Like, no, it's just how you would get maple out of a tree, you know? Or, like, um, I remember I saw a video of how monkeys open a banana. And the monkeys kind of, like, squeeze the bottom, and then it splits open. And that's it. And I, I always used, you know, I used to always tick off from the top. And then now I just kind of squeeze the bottom, and it opens. Is that me copying from a monkey? Like, or is that just how the freaking, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's just like, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Like, I wouldn't, you know? Uh, and it's not just that. It's like, if you, when you read Marx, because, you know, I've read Marx for whatever. When you read Marx, you recognize that the dude is developing it from his African perspective. I mean, sorry, his European perspective, you know? Uh, I, I just don't think that you can then look at it and be like, oh, well, he did the homework for us, you know? Or basically, you know, he's he's basically using our stuff and therefore we can use his. Like, no. He's literally, like, in debt. Like, he's... Like, the guy to read is Hegel. He's, like, literally using Hegel's um, dialectical materialism or dialectics in order to apply a dialectical materialism and therefore uh, look at history in the sort of way that it moves toward... So, so it's that capitalism uh, advances to socialism. It has nothing... Like, you, like just, just, it's just no. Like, just no. Anyway, uh, Trick Happy says, yeah, I agree. No, I'm not saying you disagree, bro. Uh, we shouldn't harp on that. That's why I call it the incubator fallacy because they make the same argument 
for religion that Abrahamic religions are Africans because they observe other elements. Yeah, it's just ridiculous. It's like everything. You just want this white boy so fucking like they just want this white boy so fucking bad. And it's disgusting. Um, learning curve says if our institutions work the way they were supposed to work, we wouldn't have these arguments about which system works best for us. There you go. You know what I mean? If we if if they work, they we wouldn't be arguing. Uh, she's, uh, so let's go on. She says, we should then invite our students and academics to take up the challenge and provide us with the most heated industrial communalist ideology and thereby give us a framework of ideas with which to solve our problems, with which to define and pursue our interests in the world. That's what I don't like about a lot of us. Like, we always say, we where's the solution? You know, like, I even see that on Twitter sometimes. Like, where's the solution? First off, I wrote a book. So y'all, like, if y'all don't even read that, like, whatever. Oh, okay, he read Conscientism, so let's go. I would caution them not to put off be put off by Nkrumah's unsound dictum that practice without thought is blind, thought without practice is empty. Let's see what this says. Practice without thought is blind. Okay. And then thought without practice is empty. Actually, I, I don't disagree with that, but let's, let's see why he disagrees with that. He said, we should realize that Nkrumah's dictum is blind to the virtues of division of labor. It suggests that thinkers who are not also agitators should be regarded as having nothing to contribute. Um. Okay. And that even a muddle-headed thinker who is an agitator is preferable to a clear thinker who is not also an agitator. Let those talented to think for us unabashedly do so. Let those who are talented agitators and political organizers do that unabashedly. And if we spawn any of those rare persons who combine first-rate thinking with first-rate organizational skills, we should be thankful and get them to contribute in the way Cabral contributed to Africa and Mao contributed to China and Lenin to Russia. Yeah, Mao and Lenin are pretty good. Cabral is pretty good, too. So... Um, but of course, we didn't protect him. Mao was protected. You know, I don't know about Lenin per se, but Mao was protected. Um, Cabral wasn't protected. For though, for the benefit of those who take up the challenge, let me stress that they should conceptualize our situation in a comprehensive way, so that the ideology they come up with can solve our problems comprehensively. Unlike Nere, Kwanda, and Co, who were trying to work out a communalistic system. Uh, but who did not explicitly impose on their system the conditions for defending it in the world as it is today, those who set out to fashion a neo-colonial system, a new communalist sorry, a communalist system, would do well to consciously design it so it can achieve the black power necessary to protect it in this century. The mix of principles of ownership of the land and other means of production must be consciously such as to allow the setting up of giant industries. That's what that's what that's what capitalism and socialism really are about. Like who controls the giant industries. In principle, there should be no reason why a giant industry should not be communally owned by an entire village or town. And now, so there you go. Now, why is it that it should be controlled by an entire village or town? You know what I mean? Now, now unless the town, like, again, like, this is where the hierarchical model comes into play. You know? Uh, modes of ownership by communities should be invented to supplement and complement individual ownership. In addition, there is much to learn from the industrialized systems of Sweden and Japan and from the pre-colonial Asante, according to Professor Ogpuku Agyemen. So look at this. So I want I want you guys to realize. So I don't I want to know an example of community ownership of a of a of a, of, a, of of industry, right? So then now if I look around the world, if I look at Sweden and I look at Japan and I look at the Ashanti, am I then going to be accused of taking from the Japanese, the Swedish, or the Ashanti, or is it just a normal thing? And by the way, Ashanti is obviously African, but still. Uh, is it just a normal thing to look around and see Wagwan? You understand? It's just like that's what you're supposed to do. Um, let me look at the comments. Learning Curve says... We seem to think that communalism punishes the capitalist and bourgeoisie. It doesn't. All it doesn't. All these different classes of people are needed to ensure that a society runs well. Administrators, ditch diggers, diplomats, industrialists, and capitalists are needed. They work together for the interests of their people. Pick your group, and that's what it is. Uh, Trigger Happy says, "Yeah, I'm glad he said industrial African communalism because every time socialists said Marx took from African communalism, in my head I always just said." Why not update African communalism? Tanzan says, greetings. Tanzan's amazing, Gramley. Tanzan's amazing. Um, tomorrow at... Uh, oh, actually, later today. So so if you guys don't know the KWZ radio schedule, so far, Sunday, Oni is at 11 a.m. Uh, Monday at 8 p.m., you have the learning curve. And then at 2 p.m., this is Eastern time, you have Tanzan behind the veil. So uh, make sure you guys check that out. And of course... Bit of Medicine is at 
Saturday at um, 8 a.m. Uh, uh, sorry, 8 p.m. 8 p.m. to 1 a.m. So it, it's 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 a it's a good one though. So um, make sure you guys check that out. Uh, Trigger Happy says learning curve. North Koreans kind of did their own variant of classification where intelligentsia is important to the society and not excluded. You know. Um, yeah, I mean, like, the, I, I outlined something inside the Book of Power. Um, uh, yeah, I think I outlined the, like, a monarchical, monarchical, hierarchical type of system. Um, but I'm going to try to get into more depth for my next book. So that's why I'm reading uh, Wealth of Nations so that I can, uh, like, not to say, oh, I'm going to take from the, 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 the white boy. It's just the reality that, you know, uh, like, essentially, we... For the most part, I think it was, I think it might have been Kofi, but somebody in the Discord was saying, um, we kind of write mostly on cultural stuff, not too much on on political or economic stuff, you know? And so you, sometimes you have to read outside of yourself to to, to, to get a, a view. And that's exactly what it is. Like, um, that's exactly what it is. That's what these white boys are doing too. I'm not gonna like, I'm not gonna fault them and be like, oh, you you owe us, you know? Like, no, like, I, I, if... Like, that's what you're supposed to do. You see foreigners are doing better than you. It's like what Malcolm X said. Malcolm X had the most, had the quote, in fact. Malcolm X said, if somebody else is doing something, if somebody else has more success than you, they're doing something you aren't doing. And I think he goes on to say, I'm not 100% sure, but he goes on to say, find out what they're doing. You know? If 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 the natives are not polluting the planet, or if the natives are don't have high crime rate, or if the natives aren't, um, uh, you know, whatever, find out why, and then say, oh, well, the reason why they don't have high crime rate is because they live in communities. Okay, well then let's try to be more communal. Like I don't blame the white boy for, for for thinking that. Like if he has a problem on his hand and he realizes another people doesn't have that problem, then he's just like 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 with Africa, it's like. The white boy, I realize the white boy don't got a problem with people invading this country. Okay? I realize that the white boy does not have a problem with people invading this country. But I do. So why doesn't the white boy have a problem with people invading this country with small military fleets in a sense? Well, the reason why they don't is because this white boy got a bunch of guns. So I said to myself, well, I guess I should have a bunch of guns too. Am I copying the white man from that? Or am I just being a fucking normal person and saying, hold up a second. How the fuck do I not have the problem this other person doesn't have? Anyway, uh, you guys get it. Um, Collectivism is the predominant impulse in Sweden in the sense that the system emphasizes the sovereignty of collective well-being over individual private interests. In Japan, where society is similarly conceived in corporate terms, individuals are seen to benefit only through the elevation of the group as a whole. In Asante, the... uh, And I sometimes say Ashanti, but the Asante... Uh, the welfare of the national society was placed well above calculations of individual self-interest and self-indulgence. The professor Ag- Agyeman, uh further elaborates, um, the logic of the Japanese capitalist system places a heavy reliance on the private market, and yet Japan's pro- market economy is not based on Adam Smith's notion that a society benefits from the liberation of individual greed, each person seeking their own self-interest. Um, okay. So I'm reading Adam Smith now. But you see, Adam Smith is pretty, you know, pretty prominent. Anyway, um, in socialist Sweden, he says, he says the, Japan's market economy is not based off of this, right? Now, Adam Smith actually makes a decent argument for this, but you could see the weaknesses when you read Adam Smith. And that's why I would not, like, replicate his model, you know? Because it, it basically, in Adam Smith's model, if a stronger state comes to a weaker state, he recommends the weaker state kind of surrender or like go about its business. But, um, but he's but like that's not. But he also points out in his book that that's 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 big trouble for the weaker state as well. You know, like it could be trouble if it's like a fundamental uh, economic um, thing. So like realistically, he doesn't even advocate for like pure capitalism. Uh, Trigger Happy says, and apparently Francophone and African intelligentsia writes a lot about economy too. Uh, oh, okay, but I can't read French. But yeah, I feel you. Um, I mean, but if somebody could translate it, why not? Uh, guys, Google, right? <laughs> Trigger Happy says, yeah, I think the conflict is center, margin, and tools. We have to take tools from our people, but our center has to be African in philosophy, social, and economic organization. I like that. Although I don't know, what was margin? You know, 
center margin and tools. We have to take tools. We could t- we, we could take tools from other people, but our center has to be African. I mean, it's really like who's going to benefit? Who's the beneficiary? You know what I mean? Who's the beneficiary? Um, is it yeah? Because like a lot of times, what white people will do is they they'll be the beneficiary, or the beneficiary will be like a, a handful of white folk. Well, although it's like collectively the white folk, um, it's like who's the beneficiary and who's the, who's the loser, who's the winner, you know? In socialist Sweden, the government's role has been to foster social uses of ownership, which is overwhelmingly private, to ensure the sovereignty of social society's interest over private interest. In mercantilist Asante, even though the public sector loomed larger than the private, no rigid antipathy to private enterprise existed. On the contrary, the private sector was nurtured by the state to generate wealth through the fostering of a breed of private entrepreneurs. Societies, socially responsible uses of the ownership of the means of production. By the way, it looks like we might be like two pages. Oh no, we're actually on the last page. So this is the last page, so let's go. Um, so, by the way, uh, before we go, Trigger Happy, um, is this one good, The African Nation? Um, let's uh, just go. I don't know if that's on my list to read things. That's why. Socially responsible uses of the ownership of the means of production, private or public, is a demonstrable value in all three cases. So socially responsible uses of the ownership of the means of production, okay, private or public, is a demonstrably value in all three cases. In Sweden, while it is acceptable for a private owner of industry to create a fortune, this is conditional on the wealth being used in socially useful ways. In Japan, the private sector exudes social responsibility through a corporate socialism that confers such benefits as lifetime employment and egalitarian job practices. In Asante, private acquisition of wealth was encouraged, but on condition that the riches were obtained by honest means and hard work and could be relied upon by the system for pecuniary assistance. You know, uh, one thing I want to get to. So there's two chapters I want to get to in Adam Smith's book. Uh, the sec- the first chapter I finally got to was of colonialism. He's going to talk about colonialism. Second chapter is about taxes, taxes and the, the need for taxes. And so, you know, a lot of what we what we like, a lot of what we consider capitalism, per se, and like a lot of it's just a like ooga booga from um, from the from the Marxist thinkers. They're just Ooh, well, these people are blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, to, to, to a degree. But you also have to recognize that if you look at the, the literature, the old literature, like they're talking about, yeah, you acquire your wealth, but you get taxed. I mean, you guys got to realize, I want to say this. Back in the 1940s or something like that, the tax rate was like 90%. You know what I mean? Like it was huge um, in America. Uh, it just recently went down, I think with Reagan or something. But like it used to be like, like during Franklin Delano Roosevelt or whatever, like the income tax rate was huge. It was like, yeah, you're not making past a certain amount. Um, uh, and like people were like, whatever. But that was a capitalist economy. That was the same capitalist economy that was doing dirty shit around the world. You know, it is what it is. Like, like it's, it's, you know, like, like you have to at some point like dig deep. By the way, uh, Trigger Happy, if you have any other questions, you know, or if you had any concerns, let me know. Um, Cause we're about to end. And when we end, it's like, you know, I can't just like continue, just, you know, twiddling my thumbs. So the greatest challenge of facing African thinkers, whether or not they are also political leaders. But if anybody has any questions, let me know before we end. The greatest challenge facing African thinkers, whether or not they are also political leaders, is to fashion an industrial communalist ideology to guide the political economy of an industrialized black superpower. In this task, they have to much to learn from the case studies of pre-colonial African countries like Asante and Zulu, and also from non-African countries like modern Japan, Sweden, Cuba, and China. So that's what I'm saying. I kind of prefer if we were to, like, if, if somebody's going to write about this, to just write about it. Because what happens is that we always say this kind of thing, like, oh, when is somebody going to come along? And it's like, the reality is that even if somebody came along, we wouldn't give a shit. We'd just be looking at the older people and asking the same damn question. Because, like I said, nobody really reads my stuff. Um, so let's see. Um, let's see what the comments are. Uh, Trigger Happy says, damn, the second message isn't loading. So I didn't, we didn't get the second message. Uh, Trigger Happy says, I'll read the African Nation one to see. I haven't read it yet. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's on my list of things to read. So I'm not even sure if I'll read it. Because uh, I, I think that, that negrophobia one, I didn't really care for that one. I'm not going to hold you. It was, uh, it was like the self-hate thing that... I don't really, I think that that's a, it's an interesting argument, but I don't really, like, I, I wouldn't waste my time on it. You know what I mean? I mean, not that I wouldn't waste my time. I mean, I did waste my time on it, but like, I feel like the self-hate, like, I don't really talk about self-hate too much. I, I know it exists uh, to a degree, 
but I think that there's like an economic reasoning behind it, you know, and that if you don't look at it from this economic standpoint, you you might try like you can't solve it. You know what I mean? Like it's a problem stemming from the economy, from economics. But thing, I also feel like the African nation. I just just guessing. It seems like we already know what it's going to be about based off of the fact that he's always mentioning it, which is good. But, you know, it's just like you want something more novel. Um, Tanzan says, I'm still catching up. I was in late. Tanzan, you're not supposed to catch up. You know, catch up is uh, is what you apply on hot dogs. You know what I mean? Um, but she's not going to hear that because it's going to be delayed. So, all right, fam. Um, any other questions, any comments, concerns, questions? Or should I just dip? All right, then. Um... So thanks, fam, for coming through. I see this three likes. Um, the the analytics is telling me that I have eight concurrent, no, five concurrent viewers. Um, I think I've tapped out at, well, possibly five or possibly eight. That's fine. Right now, I'm telling you, some sister just sent me some conservative, um, some conservative woman, I guess. She was just yelling, you know, oh, you know, Biden got COVID again and, and this and that and so forth. She is 38,000 subscribers, and there's like a 1,000 people listening to her right now. So, um, you know, it is what it is. Like, like we're small, um, but I appreciate your being here, you know? Um, like, you don't have to spend your day with me. You don't have to spend your weekend with me, but you choose to. Uh, there's a lot of other programming going on, and you, and you choose to be here. So I appreciate you for that. Um, yeah, I appreciate you for that. I guess my son sees that we're all uh, dipping, um, so he's he's gonna come back and say, "Yo, I'm hungry." But uh, all right, fam, I appreciate you guys. And uh, no, for no further comments, I'll just tell you, Shamim Hotep, Anku Jas and Neb Neb, Amen, Maat, Dua Natra.